My name's Pauline Josephine Wedderburn and I was born on the 2nd of August 1960 at St Andrews Hospital in Kingston, Jamaica. I grew up um, with my grandparents, my mum and dad. We all started home with my grandparents in Harbour View, um, but my dad, he came to England probably around 63, 64, and then my mum, she left us and joined him, I think about a year or so after. And so my early days was really spent with my grandparents um, in Harbour View until I was nearly eight and my sister was um, nearly seven. Um, I, I don't actually remember that much. What I do remember, I, I remember my, my grandmother, she was a full-time house maker. She didn't go out to work and uh, she brought us up. I remember my granddad, he went out to work and I do have a little memories of waiting by the front, the front gate, and we'd see him coming down the road and we'd rush in and get his slippers and we'd be the ones that would put his slippers on. And um, I know we had a dog, it was like an Alsatian dog, but back in Jamaica, they weren't pets, they were like house dogs, you know, yard dogs. <laughs> I, I'm not a lover of dogs, but I do remember we had this Alsatian dog. Um, um, school, we did go to school. Um, the difference there is that you didn't go up uh, to, uh, into the next level. It wasn't chronologically based on your age, it was your ability. So actually at one time, even though my sister was younger than me, she was obviously brighter and she was in a class above me. Uh, so that was a difference. Um, and it, it was, you, you progressed depending on your ability. So the class, you'd have different age children in the class. It was really done about on, on your ability. I do remember um, a sense of feeling happy and a sense of feeling secure. And it took like 10 years. We left when we were, when I was nearly eight, and it took 10 years before I actually got back to Jamaica. But it was wonderful, that kind of emotional connection I felt with my grandma. It was something that I didn't necessarily have with my mum. Uh, it, and it was things like, I could talk to her just easily about boyfriends and things. I wouldn't dare talk to my mum about boyfriends. <laughs> but it was, you know, at the time, you know, Noel and I was together even then, and I could, I was talking to her about Noel and things like that. I've never really had those kind of conversations with my mum. And so I think that's, dis despite the 10 years, you know, that I, we were apart, that connection was still there. Um, I think she was a beautiful, beautiful woman. She was a very loving, caring um, woman. She, as I said, she spent all her life actually being a care, a caregiver. Um, she not only looked after me and my sister, she looked after my two cousins as well. Uh, same thing, their parents came, came to the UK. So she spent her whole life actually looking after children. She was a very... Um, Christian woman and um, church, you know, that was Sunday. Sunday you put on your Sunday best and you went to church. Until her grave, she was um, a stout um, Christian woman. My granddad, I, I don't remember very much, particularly um, as such. He was a hard working man, always worked all his life. And um, he, my grandmother was quite dark and he was quite fair. And I only mention that because in Jamaica in those days, you know, sort of silliness in terms of complexion and, um, you know, uh, but anyhow, he was called Mars Joe. We called him, Grand he was grandpa to us, but people called him Mars Joe and um, Ma Daisy. And uh, he was a very, um, stable, 
pr a stable person, provided for his family, you know. Um, as I said, his wife, she never had to, grandma didn't have to go out to work. <laughs> Like most <laughs> people from the Caribbean, they had a five-year plan. They came basically um, to better themselves. Um, so it was more for employment. My dad, when he was in Jamaica, he was training to be a dentist. And uh, he thought, well, he could carry on and would get an apprenticeship as an dentist when he came to this country. And my mom, she, she, worked like did office jobs but what she wanted to do was to train to be a dietitian and when when my dad came well they're not giving black people back in those days apprenticeship jobs to be a dentist and um my mum um when she inquired for her to do that training she was gonna have to um live in and as she said She's a married woman, <laughs> she can't live in. So she abandoned that idea. I know my grandma, she said um, that day when we left, she said, uh, my, her and my granddad, they cried, they cried, they cried. Because they didn't want us to go, but, you know, didn't really have a say in the matter. And um, the reason we came when we came, um, the idea, uh, my mum and dad, they only came for five years. They thought, oh, they can't make their money make their foot and, go, and come back to Jamaica. But it wasn't, you know, it took them 30 years or so before they actually finally managed to get back to Jamaica. But um, what, they were in a syndicate. It, um, it was the pools, a bit like the lottery, but people would bet on the pool. It was kind of guessing what the, the football results would be. Anyway, they were part of this syndicate and they actually won some money. I think they each got like £1,100, which back in those days was a lot of money. And my mum said, basically, we need to use that money, one, to get a house and two, to bring up me and my sister. And that's how we ended up you know, being able to come when we came. They just couldn't afford it before. <laughs> if you think about it, um, all their friends, um, everybody came. It was, it's what people did um, in terms of opportunity. I know my mum's reflect, she used to reflect, um, and she said she often wondered what life would be, if it would be better if they had stayed, because she compares herself to like some of her friends who they went to America and some stayed in Jamaica and they've all done very well for themselves. So she says she does wonder about it, but then, uh, and I know mummy said when she came, oh, she said it was so hard. She cried, she cried, she cried. It was cold. I think it was the first time she saw snow. Uh, her, my dad and my brother were living in one room with a paraffin eater. You know, it wasn't easy. It, it was really hard and she actually wanted to come home. She wanted to go back, um, but that kind of passed. So I think it was just, they kind of, and also they, I, I think they, they wanted a better life for their children, which I think they felt um, we might get here rather than Jamaica. And I think, I don't know if they consciously think about it, but I'm just trying to make sense of it. But, you know, back then, people believed in England as a mother country. You know, the streets were paved with gold. And so there was this belief. And of course, people who lived here didn't, didn't, um, break that illusion, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to say to people, don't come, you know. So they came because they thought they would be welcomed. Of course, it was a total opposite story. They weren't welcomed. And um, uh, so I, I don't know if the decision, if they consciously thought about it, but they weren't in a position necessarily to, to go back and and I think as well, it was whatever sacrifices they made, they made it in the hope that their children would have a better future. That's what I, you know, that's what I think, why maybe they stayed as well. I think they just, um, when they left Fulham, they were, um, they managed to get the house in Wimbledon 
And even that's sort of, a story that they weren't meant to be in that house. My, they'd seen a house somewhere in, I think, North London. I can't remember the area now. And, um, but they couldn't get the mortgage because they declared they had three children. And basically, the people who were providing the mortgage didn't see how they could possibly afford this mortgage with three children. And so they lost that house, but every cloud's got a silver lining because Mummy said the house we did live in and did get was a better house. It was bigger, it was better, but they didn't declare they had three children and they got the mortgage. <laughs> My memory of primary school, when I came, I had a very strong Jamaican accent and both the black and the white children teased me terribly because of my accent. And, but I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't take no nonsense. The amount of fights I got into because I really didn't take no nonsense and I fought back. And there was one occasion, I won't mention his name. <laughs> I think I even remember his name up to this day. But after, after being, I used to actually get the better of them, boys as well, I used to get the better of them. But anyway, on this occasion, the teacher told him to apologize. And so he did apologize and he, he got me this ring. I think it's only like, you know, costume, it wasn't anything valuable. But I took it home and my mum said, oh, what, what, what'd you get that from? So I said to her, she said, give it back. She said, you cannot buy friendship. So I had to give him back his ring. <laughs> but um, the other memory I have, my mum, she insisted that we had to have school dinners because she said, you're in England now, you have to get used to in eating English food. I couldn't cope with school dinners, but the school I went to, it was the type of school where you weren't allowed to leave the dining hall until you ate everything. The, the main meal I could cope with, but I actually didn't like custard and I really didn't like the desserts. But the only way I could get to leave that dining hall, I used to just swallow it and then I'd go in the toilet and, and actually just vomit. I, our stomach rejected it. Um, so that's what I remember. But on a whole, I, I loved school, but those early days, that sort of transition, they weren't easy, got teased quite a bit. My sister and I, we walked to school. It was like just sort of down the road. It was, um, it was a church school. Um, so my early memories, on a whole, I, I, I love school. I, I did enjoy school, but those, that's the bit I remember being teased because of my accent. And we were a little bit of a novelty because uh, we came from Jamaica. Um, went to middle school. Uh, I think that was from the age of about 11 to 13. And uh, one of the memories I have was the English teacher saying to me, oh, you speak very good English. Was you born in this country? I said, no, <laughs> I was born in Jamaica. But it, again, it kind of shows you the ignorance, kind of thinking, well, what language do you think people speak in Jamaica? But um, that's the memory I have in a way of, um, of, of middle school. Uh, but on a whole, I, you know, thinking about, well, people in adversity overcoming, you know, having to leave your main attachments. My grandparents were my main attachments, so breaking that attachment, coping with the sort of separation issues and loss. Um, I know that it, I was very, it came out in my behavior, which people might call challenging, but I used to lie. I used to be argumentative with my parents. They asked me to do something, but why, 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 why do I have to do that? Um, and mommy, she would often, and I would resist, um, and she would say, I'm gonna hit you, you know, and I'd be, go on then. I'd really be in their face. But that's how I dealt, that's, so my, sadness was came out like as me being bad um where my sister it, she went into herself so again 
it's mummy telling us this, where Paula, she would find her many a time just sitting at the bottom of the stairs, just daydreaming. And she went, took her to the doctor and the doctor said, you just have to give her time. She's homesick and she's pining for her grandparents. So she went into herself and I, my, my, the impact on me came out, I guess, in my, uh, my behaviour. Um, but, um, but school, but in terms of how do I cope with that, I think maybe what I had, both my sister and I, we loved reading. We were bookworms. And in those days, well, there weren't no mobile phones. We didn't have PlayStation or any of those games. Our pastime, it was, we would go to the library. You were allowed to take out four books at a time and we would get through four books in a few days. We, we loved reading, but um, the other things we did, we, board games, um, Ludo, Snakes and Ladders. I don't know if you've heard of Jack's. Uh, marbles, hopscotch, where you get the clay thing and, you know, mark out your hopscotch things, chalk, and um, we'd play. That was our pastime. That was half fun growing up in, in, in the UK. My dad always used to say, um, it's a bit like, you know, if you're going to get anywhere as a black person, even as a black child in school, you you have to be the best. You can't just be average or, you know, be a wallflower. You've got to say, he would always say, if the teacher asks you a question, make sure you put up your hand, you put up your hand. And so I, I was very, it was quite easy for me to be very vocal. And, and um, but I also, I did, I, I, I was, you know, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed school. <music> I used to, we used to go ice skating and um, for us it was um, going to the cinema. Um, back in those days, I don't know if they still do it, but it was like Saturday morning cinema. And so that was our fun. We would go Saturday morning cinema and um, they used to have like talent contest. And I do remember my sister and myself with a group of other friends, there were about five of us. We, um, you didn't get any prize or anything, but if you just wanted to showcase your talent. And so the Osmonds, I don't know if you've heard of the Os Donny Osmond, but I think it was the Osmonds, they sang this song called Crazy Horses. And so we made up this dance routine and we went up, it was at the cinema, and you went up on stage and you did your routine. And um, so every Saturday morning for us, it was going to the Saturday morning pictures. And then afterwards, I think a bag of chips cost about 5p or 10p, something like that. Um, but reading, I said, we love to read. It, it, um, so it was basically, we spent a lot of time at the library and, and getting books out from the library. Um, as a teenager, um, it was more going out. Loved to go out, loved music, loved art. I used to buy a lot of records and I think I got that, um, inherited that from my dad. And so I grew up on James Brown music, <laughs> dare I even say it, Jim Reeves. But um, my teenage days was the era of Lovers Rock. And so Janet Kay, you know, I think that's the first, her Silly Games, I think that's probably one of the first songs I learned heart, you know, word for word. And um, it's quite funny, you don't realise things that you do, but when I wasn't feeling happy or, you know, miserable about something, I would actually go into our front room and my dad had his music system up and I would play his music, but all the sort of sweet soul music, sort of wallowing. But my mum always realised, because she used to say to my dad, Paul, go talk to your daughter, because she realised something was obviously bothering me. Uh, I didn't really realise I used to do that, but I did. That's what I used to do. I'd go in the front room and put on the music, almost like therapeutically. I was mainly into reggae. We were more into reggae music. So although we lived in Wimbledon, a lot of the clubs were more this, you know, North London. And uh, they never stopped us, but, like, we would be leaving home to get the last train to go out raving 
And, you know, my dad would say, I want a girl picnic, I want a car, find anywhere for God. Salt, like, that, everything is not, not, not. When we arrived, when we came, they, mummy, they insisted we had to go to church. And, um, All Saints Church, but it was one of those great, big Church of England, high, I call it a high church. My memory of it, it was really big, it was really cold, and it was all that fran frankincense and myrrh that they did. Really didn't like it, but what Paula and I used to do, um, we used to take our time, and then we would go to the church, but we didn't go in, and then we'd go home, and we'd say, oh, we couldn't get in, we were late, and they closed the door. And my mum, for a few weeks, she'd be leaving, and she'd say, what? What kind of church and closed, closed door? Anyway, we got away with it for a few weeks, but then we couldn't, uh, after a while, she realised, because uh, we were lying, we just didn't want to go, um, and we, kept, we ran out of excuses. <laughs>And also it was like my fifth choice. I lived in Wimbledon. I, I, just, ch I just chose universities that was in and around London, basically. And, um, and for one reason or another, I, I didn't get into... The, it was either... Not because I wasn't able to, but it was like I was too late, you know, the closing date had gone, or one, I think, was closing, the course was going to be... So it was various different reasons. So I ended up going to... Um, interview at Oxford um, as a fifth choice, not really particularly wanting to go, um, but that's where I ended up um, uh, doing my master's and the CQSW. Um, and again, I, uh, uh, Oxford, that was an experience. <laughs> I didn't, I went there as a postgrad student, so I wasn't an undergraduate, I was a postgraduate student. I went 1982 to 84, so I was 22, and um, my, so I didn't, where I lived, it was university, it was a university building, but it wasn't on campus. I didn't live on campus, so I lived in the community, uh, and it was one of these great big houses, and on each floor, there were like five rooms. Uh, I, you, when you go to Oxford, you have to belong to a college. And I belong to one of the more um, newer colleges, which is called Green College. But they took um, social work students and medical students. So um, the house I lived in, it was all medical students and social work students. And we all, and it, the house belonged to Green College. I was the only black person um, there, but, and we shared the living room and we shared the kitchen, but by then I was, you know, I'd go in girl guides and go in camping and I'd always feel embarrassed because it's like, oh, what's that you're putting on your skin, you know, oh, yeah, you know, grease in the air, and I would cringe and really not wanting anybody else to see it because I was the only, like, black person, but by the time I was in my 20s, I was very proud of being black, and um, and so I would cook my West Indian food and everything, and um, I'd wear my hair in plaits, you know, and just be me. And when I get into conversations, even these were like social work students who were planning to go to the inner cities to work as social workers with black communities. And I was the first black person they knew or ever spoke to. Um, and so that was a bit of a shock. Um, what I... Um, one of the tutors, I don't think she liked me, and I think she called me vivacious, but she meant it in a, as a put-down. And I, I, you know, people sort of said, oh, maybe there was a bit of jealousy, perhaps. Um, but my personal tutor, how it worked, you, you had your own personal tutor. And my personal tutor, Juliet che che Cheatham, she's a white woman, but she spent a lot of her social work uh, time in, in, in Brixton. So she wrote loads of books about anti-racism and working with black families, what have you. Um, so I didn't, um, but 
I was conscious there was only two of us on that course. They were trying very hard, I think, to be more diverse in terms of who um, they got. As I said, I wasn't particularly, didn't particularly want to go there. Um, but in terms of the education, you can see why they excel because you have, I forget what they call them now, but you have your, you, you meet with like a, a tutor, you're a part of a tutor group and there's only like four or five of you. And so you have that very one-to-one one -one kind of conversations, discussions about your work, your, your assignments. Um, so the infrastructure was quite good in terms of academia. Um, but what I realised, Oxford, beautiful place, but the university owned most of the good, good properties and the lovely parks and what have you. And then there was another area in Oxford called Blackbird Lees. I don't know if you know, but David Rodigan, that's where he came from. <laughs> but that was the black community. As a black person going to Oxford, funny enough, the cleaner... Oh, I can't, Mrs. White was her name. The cleaner was a black Jamaican woman. And she kind of took me under her wings. And she would invite me. She lived in Blackbird Lees. And I tell you, it was very, I tell you, for the first time, I, I kind of properly lived away from home. And I, it, it did feel when my mom and everybody who came with me and they left, that sense of loneliness, I did feel quite lonely. But she took me under her wings and she invited me to her house for dinner. She was taking my dirty washing home to wash for me. And after a couple of weeks, I said to her, it's lovely that you're doing this. But I said, I've got to get on and you know, <laughs> do these things for myself. But through her, I found the black community and um, and so I volunteered. They had a Saturday um, Saturday uh, or do they Saturday school. So I volunteered my services at the Saturday school. I made really good friends with some of the local young you know people in Blackbird Lees. And most of my spare time, I was in Blackbird Lees. And it was interesting. Like my um, social work. Um, the other social work students, like people I live with, they'd say, aren't you frightened? Aren't you scared of going to Blackbird Lees? Because within Oxford and within the social services, um, uh, most of the, the problem families on social services books, the black people came from Blackbird Lees and the white problem type families or family came from another area, I think it was called Rose Hill. Um, and I said, actually, I feel safer in Blackbird Lees than I do in London. And it was I it was a real community spirit. I mean, people who I stayed with, it was just a tradition that they kept their back, you didn't go to the front door, you just went to people's back door and it was open and you just and people just let themselves in. They didn't close their back door. I said, Do you think I could go out in London and not close my door? You'd never hear of it. They were very, they, they're the kind of parents who believed um, in talking and, and, and discussion. So I have fond memories sitting at that dining table, particularly on a Sunday, and that was the time um, that we, um, we used to discuss the world, discuss all the gossip about the family and, you know, what was what. Oh, have all our arguments about this, that, and the other. Um, but they never, it wasn't that kind of attitude where children must be seen but not heard. We were encouraged to have an opinion and, and talk it. And sometimes it actually used to backfire. I used to say to my dad, it's kind of backfired on you because, again, just fast forward a little bit, like going to college and I was learning about sexism and racism. And of course, when he would have some of his friends around, I would take them on and argue with them. And he'd say, oh, that college is brainwashing you. So it's a bit like he was a victim of his own <laughs> sort of preaching. Um, but in another way, he would take me and my sister, he would take us out some places. He said, don't tell your mother, I'm take you here, you know. Um, so I was very, I, I, I would talk to my dad about things that I wouldn't necessarily talk to my mum about. She was probably more the disciplinarian one. And you did get those times where it was, if we asked daddy, he'd say, oh, ask your mother. If we asked her, she'd say, oh, ask your father. 
actually, if mummy said yes, we're good. <laughs> you know, we're kind of good to go. Um, they were both, I would describe, uh, very working class. I might have a middle class job now, but I consider myself working class. They were hard working, working class people. My mum, even though she was married, um, she was very independent. She's always worked. Uh, all her adult life, she's, she's always worked, married or not married, she's always worked. And she always said, she, she said, even if you get married, Paulie, she says, make sure you have your own bank account. And so I still have my own, I actually didn't even change my name. Um, as parents, they were hardworking. Um, they were, um, they were the Christmas, you mentioned Christmas, for well, Christmas in, 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 um, in this country, that was really happy time of year. Um, but my mum and dad, they almost like had an open house. And so everybody, Christmas Eve, we spent at an uncle's house. So the big party was at Uncle John's house Christmas Eve. Everybody went there. Christmas Day was our house. And so Christmas Day, um, <laughs> you name it, the <laughs> chicken, pork, fish, gammon, steak, the whole shebang. But they invited everybody in the sense that all the single people, all the divorced people amongst family and friends. So you never, so the house is always full and it always ended up being this lovely party, but you never, it wasn't, the, and it was a case of if you can find somewhere to sit on the stairs or you stand, it wasn't none of this sitting at your dining table and eating your Christmas dinner. Um, uh, and after, and so it was fun. But I, as grown as a grown up, like when my mum and dad when they went back to Jamaica, um, my brother and my sister and myself, we tried to keep up that tradition where we would all meet, uh, meet up at somebody's house. Um, but after a while, it just got too stressful for all of us. So we decided, actually, we actually want to be experience sitting at a dining table and eating our own like Christmas dinner. And so after a while, that's what we did. And then in the evening, if we didn't feel too tired, <laughs> or it wasn't raining or so, we would then meet up in the evening. But growing up, that's, that was our, it, the house, it was everybody, everybody came. Thank you.